لك البرود كيس Good evening, dear participants, and welcome to the first night of the international webinar on religion and politics in Mizoram, negotiating the church secular dichotomy mm -hmm. organized by the Department of Political Science, Government Searchship College. First and foremost, I would like to issue a sincere apology to all our participants, as well as our esteemed resource persons, due to unprecedented and unforeseen technical problem that we faced yesterday. We have to request all our 400 plus participants who already have registered for this webinar program to re-register themselves in the last minute. And also we have to tell our resource persons about our problem and request them to adjust accordingly. So since some of the problems, especially the technical ones are out of our hands and our capabilities like the one we faced yesterday, we are very sorry that we have to request you to re-register for this webinar program in the very last minute. So on behalf of the organizing team, I would like to apologize for all the inconveniences 
or any other problems that we have caused. At the same time, it is a great relief that our problem had been solved in time to proceed with the Shenmue program. So before we start our inaugural session and other technical sessions, I would like to make a small announcement for all our participants. Since this is an international webinar, e-certificates will be issued to all the participants who have participated or attended at least three out of the five technical sessions to be conducted during the course of this webinar. After the closure of this uh, program at the end of the week, we will be sending you e-certificates to your mail shortly, but it will be for those participants who have attended at least three out of the five technical sessions. We have made this arrangement, keeping in mind the inconveniences caused by the technical errors that we face yesterday. And besides the timing of the event, which will be held every night from 7.30 to 8.30, would be of some convenience to you. And our technical session, tonight's session, as well as the other sessions in the other nights, will always be broadcasted live in the official YouTube channel of our college, Government Sership College. And you can, if you want to, you can access the proceedings of this webinar, the whole webinar, from the official channel of the college. So now, I would like to call our respected principal, Mr. C. Lodin Pluanga, to deliver his welcome speech and opening statement. Sir. Good, morning. Good evening, everybody. It is a great honor for me to give a welcome and opening address of this one week international webinar on the theme of church and politics in Mizoram. Negotiating the church secular dichotomy organized by Department of Political Science, Government Searchship College. I like to extend a special, special welcome to all of our distinguished resource persons for taking your time from your heavy and busy schedules. We are really grateful to have such a dynamic persons like you in this webinar. We're really grateful to you. Secondly, I would also like to extend a warm welcome to all participants. And I hope that you will take the time to learn and interact with our distinguished resource persons. I would like to express my gratitude to the organizers of this webinar for their devotions and hard working. As it is said that whoever you, whoever you are and whatever you want to be, you may not be interested in politics but politics is interested in you. Like this, we cannot turn our back to politics. Church and politics cannot be separated totally in our society, especially in Mizoram. Because the persons who are concerned by politics are also concerned by the church. Therefore, we can say that Church and politics are interrelated to each other. And sometimes they are influencing each other in our society. This will make our team very interesting. I hope that all the resource person and the participants will enjoy this webinar and reap the fruits. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, sir, for your concise and thoughtful statement. And we shall now start our technical session. And before we uh, hand over the session to our resource person, I'll give a brief introduction of our resource person for tonight. Professor Jung Kongam Dongil will be our resource person tonight. And he is a professor and director, Internal Quality Assurance Cell, Mizoram University. And before I hand over the session, let me give a brief introduction about him. Professor Dongil finished his graduation with honors in political science at Patkai Christian College, Nagaland in 1993. He obtained his MA political science with first class third position from Manipur University in 1996. He started his teaching career as lecturer in the Department of Political Science at Bethany Christian College, Chur Churachanpur, Manipur from April 1996 to May 1997. 
He was also a faculty member in the Department of Political Science, Government, Long Klai College, Long Klai Mizoram from 8 May 1998 till 9 July 2016. And he joined the Department of Political Science, Mizoram University as Associate Professor on 10th July 2012. Professor Dongle was head of the Department of Political Science at, at MZU from 15 July 2013 to 31st July 2016 and was promoted to the rank of professor with effect from 10th July 2015. Professor Dongle has presented 70 papers in international, national, regional, and state level seminars across the country. He has also presented more than 20 papers in local seminars in Mizo language organized by various civil societies and churches. He has also delivered 90 lectures at various academic platforms, and he has published 24 papers in academic journals, 22 papers in edited volumes, and four papers in seminar proceedings. Professor Dongdol has also completed one UGC minor research project in 2010 and ICSSR major research project in 2016. He is also a recipient of the Fulbright Nehru Academic and Professional Excellence Fellowship 2020 to 2021. And he got affiliation in the Department of Political Science, University of Cincinnati, Cincinnati, Ohio, USA, and is due to leave for the United States from April 1st, 2021 till December 31st, 2021. Professor Dongle has also authored four books, one edited book and two co-edited books. His book, Lie Chieftainship and Its Impact in Politics, is in the process of its second edition print. And above all, he is also, my he is also one of my beloved teachers who have greatly helped me while I was conducting my research under the Department of Political Science in Missouri University. And one of our resource persons who is also present tonight as one of our panelists, Dr. Ayang Hong Siam Kishore, which I fondly refer to him as Sir SK. He is my research supervisor during my MPhil and PhD. He is one of my beloved teacher and my academic mentor. So we are very fortunate to hear from such a distinguished academician like Professor Dongel tonight. And lastly, for this is for the participants. If you have any question for our resource person, Professor Dongel, Please feel free to drop your questions at the Q&A box and not in the chat box. I repeat, please drop your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and not in the chat box so that we can have a Q&A session, question and answer session after the end of the lecture. Okay, now I shall hand over the session to our resource person, Professor Dongle. Sir, are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay, sir, the session is now yours. Okay. Hmm. Can you see the screen? Yes, sir, we can see. Okay. At the outset, I'd like to express my thanks and gratitude to Department of Political Science, Government Searchship College, for taking the initiative in organizing this one week international webinar. And these days, due to the ongoing pandemic, we have to find ways and means so that our academic duties may be fulfilled. And webinars seems to be one of the most available and useful machinery for interacting among the academicians. And in this regard, Political Science Department of Government Chief College has done a great job. And I'm also particularly thankful to Zara and with his colleague who take the initiative in organizing this. And today, tonight, the topic of my deliberation will focus. It will be a light 
introductory part. So after that, specific topic will be touched upon by other panelists. And tonight, I'll be delivering on evolution of religion and political relationship among the Zhao ethnic group, conceptual and constitutional dimensions, which special reference to Mizoram. So the background of religion and political relationship for how the concept evolved and how was the relationship among the Zhou ethnic group in pre-conversion to Christianity, after conversion to Christianity with the coming of the British rule, then what is the conceptual notion of what led to the emergence of secularism and what is its concept, the Western concept, and what is the concept in the constitution of India. Then at last, we will deliberate on the issue in Mizoram. So that will be the sequence of the discussion. Okay, to save time. Now, let me start deliberation on the topic. Okay, we'll start with introduction. Religion and politics are equally important. Religion, religion and politics are two guiding factors of human life. Two guiding factors of human life, two guiding phenomena of human society. So one cannot be neglected at the cost of other, and one cannot be given importance at the cost of other. It should be properly balanced. So long as religion and politics are properly balanced, there will be peace, tranquility, and there will be order in the society. But once this balance is not maintained, anything can happen in society. So these religion and politics, they are equally important in human civilization. In all human civilization, it is equally important. And religion in literary term can be defined as existence of God or gods and activities which are connected with worship. Existence of God or activities which connect with, which connected with the worship. So anything concerning with God and anything concerning with worship, it is termed as religion in literary terminology. Then what about politics? Politics in literary terminology can be defined as art of government, art of political affairs or political aspect. So those are the two liter literary terminology for religion and politics. And this religion, religion is one of the most influential forces in human society. And it saves relationship within the human society. So the most in, important influencer force in human society is religion. Religion can set, religion can unify, and religion can group people together. On the other hand, it can separate also. That's why religious beliefs and community and values motivate human thinking and human actions in society. So influence of religion in human thinking, human action and human society is very, very significant. And yes, religion saves the life of human beings in multi-dimensional way. As religion saves the human beings in every aspect of life. What did Dr. S. Radhakrishnan say? Dr. Sarvalipali Radhakrishnan, who was former president of India, he said that people who do not have religion are like animals. That's how Dr. Radhakrishnan commented about people who don't have religion. That means people who don't have religion are like animals. That means they don't have proper guidance. If people do not have proper guidance, if people do not have proper ethics, that means 
they are same as you animals. That was the comment given by President, former President Radhakrishnan. So religion may be any type of religion. It can be Hinduism, Buddhism, it can be Zionism, Zoroastrianism, Judaism, or Taoism, or any religion, but it saves the life and destiny of human beings. And talking more about religion, religion is not merely collection of rituals, not merely collection of traditions and ways of worship, but what is the important tenet of religion? It upholds sets of values. It upholds sets of good values, which can guide and which can lead men in the, in the right direction. That's why all religious persons follow this value in their rituals and tradition. As religion contains values, many values, what did father of the nation, Mahatma Gandhi say? Truth is my God. He said, truth is my God. And he stood for truth. He fought against the British by using truth. And through truth, what he called Satyagraha, he fought evils in the world. That's why, what type of religion may, may, may be? All religions promote supreme value, truth, nonviolence, morality, worship of God, and respect of mankind. If there is any religion which taught, which teaches about discrimination of a particular community or particular society, that may, that, that may not be the right type of religion. Then what about politics? Politics is originally derived from Greek word polis. Polis means city-state. And why city-state is called polis politics? Because it denotes the art of governance and political activities in city-state. So from the art of governance and political activities, which we have done, which we are practiced here in the Greek city-state, people came to know the art of governance, people came to know the art of governing, and political activities began. That's why the word politics, it is derived from city-state, and it was believed that political activities and political consciousness and all out of governance, it started from the Greek city states. That's why- Sir, sir one minute. Uh, can you please maximize your slide? Put it in the slideshow mode, sir, please. Yeah, above that one, sir, there is a small icon there. Slide show. Oh, insert. In oh, So on from current slide, the uh, left hand corner. from current slide, the. Oh. Oh, I the answer. So every political activities out of governance and political notion <clears throat> are believed to have been started from the Greek city state police. That's why as human society began with religion, politics also began with human society. Due to that, religion and politics are both inseparable from human beings. Due to that, great political scientist R. H. Sortau says, quote, politics is the concern of everybody with 
any sense of responsibility for everybody is affected. So, what is politics? It is of everybody with sense of responsibility. All those people who have sense of responsibility, they concern with politics. Why? Because everybody is affected by politics. Whether we want it or not, we cannot avoid. Due to that, all conscious citizens with sense of responsibility should be and would be concerned with politics, according to R.H. Sorta. Then what did another great political scientist, Marcel Bierman says? Marcel Bierman says, quote, wherever you are or want to be, you may not be interested in politics, but politics is interested in you. So you may not be interested, you may not care, but politics is chasing you. Politics is always interested in you. That's why all human beings who have normal thinking, politics is interested in them. So in all citizens, in all conscious citizens, politics is interested. Due to that, all, all right thinking citizens should be interested in politics and all conscious citizens cannot neglect politics. Like politics, they cannot neglect religion. That's why any citizen should give equal importance and significance to both religion and politics. When we go back to history, in all human civilizations, whether it be Indus Valley civilization, Chinese civilization, Sumerian civilization, Egyptian civilization, or many other civilization, religion and politics set the destiny of the civilization. And in all these civilization, where balanced relationship was maintained between religion and politics. But once where balanced relationship could not be maintained between religion and politics, then civilization will be disturbed. Civilization would decay. But so long as balance is properly maintained between religion and politics, then civilization will grow in the right direction. And religion and politics also play significant role in Greek city-state, Greek kingdom, Roman empire, then in many empires like British Empire, Russian Empire, then France Empire. That's why starting from ancient time, these religion and, religion and politics play equal and significant role in all human society, in all kingdoms, and in all civilization. And relationship between religion and politics neither decline nor ignore, even in modern democratic system. But after the far century AD, with the spread of Christianity and establish of church in the European countries and in America, church became popular. That's why the concept religion seems to be replaced by church in the Western country. Due to that, church and state, not religion and politics, church and state began to be a popular terminology. And due to that, many political philosophers and many thinkers, they thought, wrote, and propagated about the relationship between church and state. So in this propagation of relationship between church and state, the concept of secularism emerged. And like all nations and all ethnic groups of the world, though ethnic group who trace common relationship from mythological cave, known by different names, this group of people, this group of conglomerate tribes, 
they also inherit, inherited relationship between religion and politics. And that relationship between religion and politics afterwards was then transformed into church and state relationship after conversion to Christianity. In such a way, so in all history of the world, in all civilization, in all kingdom, starting from ancient time till modern, every human society is said this time and depend upon the type of relationship maintained between religion and politics. Okay, now we shall move on to the second point. Relationship of religion and politics among the Zo ethnic group. So now uh, we will deliberate on, discuss on the main point of the topic. Most of us are clear with the term Zo ethnic group. So in the context of Mizoram, Whenever we use the terms of ethnic group, all inhabitants, all inhabitant tribes of Mizoram, except Chakma and Bru, can be included in this time. And other than Chakma and Bru, there are many other who are included within this time. Now we'll focus on this. So these Zo ethnic group are conglomerate tribes who trace common origin to mythological camp. And this mythological camp was known by different name to different tribes of the ethnic group. And this was handed down from generation to generation in oral history. So popularly it was known as Chinlung, some call it Xinlung, some call it Hul, some call it Hulpi, some call it some call it Hulpui, some call it Hultu Bizur, some call it Hol, some call it Pu, some Lungkwa and Hulpi. And the exact location of this Chinlung or Hul cannot be verified, but it is believed to be located in South China. And this day, even from among the Zhou ethnic groups, some intellectual, they are apprehensive about this Chinlung theory, Hul theory, as illogical is not authentic and is a very uh, something story which could not be proved in such a way some criticize it. But despite that, despite those command, this cannot be neglected as illogical. Why? Had this theory been not authentic, had this theory been uh, not correct, this theory might not be passed down from generation to generation in oral history among the tribes of the ethnic group. But it was handed down from generation to generation through oral history. That's why it cannot be just neglected as illogical. And at the top of that, for tracing history also, like there were some who propagated Deleuze theory, some said creation theory, which seems to be more illogical than what we call Shindo. In such a way, uh, whether we agree it or not, this is the most common historical ground through which our common history could be traced. And as I've said, uh, the location was believed to be somewhere in South China. Then from where by following Brahmaputra and Selvan River, they migrated down and Fall Father settled down in Kolphai, Burmese Plain. And when at the time when they settled down in Burmese Plain, Kolphai, they were known as Jin by the Burmese. And after that, Jin became the identifying name for Zhou people in Burma. And till today, all tribes of the Zhou ethnic group, they are recognized 
and identified as Xin. And from Kolpai, Burmese plain, they moved towards the Prayan Jin state, Jin Hills. And many settled in Jin Hills. Then from Jin Hills, some of the groups moved farther down to Lusai Hills, Chittagong Hill tracks. And those who moved towards Chittagong, they were known as Kuki by the Bengali. That's why to the Bengali, all those who ethnic group, they call them as Kuki. And due to that, after Chin, Kuki also began to be the calling name for the group. And from Lusai Hills, those, some of them, they move farther towards Assam, Manipur, Tripura, Meghalaya, then up to Nagaland. And some even moved back to Burma. So such was the migration route of the Zoethnic Zoet Zoet people. And after the British came into contact with them, those who settled in Lusai Hills, they were known as Lusai, corrupted form of Lusai. Because Lusai tribe was the majority occupying Lusai Hills. And the territory also came to be known as Lusai Hills. And that's why the British identified this ethnic group who occupied different territories as Jin Kuki Lusai. And in Lusai Hills, the terminology Mizo began to be popular on the independence. And after that, ethnic identification, identification also came to be known as Jin Kuki Mizo. And other terminologies like Zomi and Chikim also have been propagated. However, the term Zo without prefix and suffix me began to be popularized as inclusive nomenclature of the whole Zo ethnic group since the establishment of Zoro, Zo Reunification Organization at Champai in 1988. And this Zo ethnic group in linguistic classification, they can be broadly classified and divided into two groups. One is those linguistic group who use R sound more. And the other is linguistic group who use less R sound or G sound more. That's why these tribes of the Zo ethnic group can be divided into, broadly divided into R group, those who use R sound, R sound more, and G group, those who use G sound more. Like for those group of the, for, for those of the R group, for example, land, they call it rum, but the G group, they call it gum. Then snake, the R group, they call it rule, but the Z group, they call it Gul. And War, the R group, they call it Ral, the Z group, they call it Gal. Then Bamboo, R group, they call it Rua, and Z group, they call it Go. Then what we call Whale, Property, R group, they call it Row, Z group, they call it Go. And one popular river from Manipur, which flow down to Jin State, was popularly known as Manipur River. But the ethnic group, those R group, they call it Rune, but those Z group, they call it Gun. That's why in this broad classification of R group and Z group, the linguistic setup of the Zo ethnic group can be classified. And people who are using this G sound, they find it difficult to pronounce R. Then who are the tribes belonging to R groups? R group comprise of many tribes who use R sound. Like 
Aimol, Anal, Bom, Biete, Jiru, Sote, in Mizoram, they are known as Sote, Darlong, Halam, Mar, Rangkol, Koloi, Kram, Lusei, Kom, Koiring, Koibu, Lamkang, Lai Rong, Lai, also known as Poi, Matu, Maring, Muikumi, Mara, also known as Laker, Payon, Monsang, Pang, Purum, Ralte, Rupini, Sairang, Saketsep, and Tlanglao. They are the G group tribes, the R group tribe, I mean. Then G group comprise of Gangte, Taite, Simte, Sizang, Tidimchin, Tadokuki, Taite, Tangkal, Vaipe, Zhou. And Far's use of terminology Zhou was said to be in the writing of Fan Zhou, diplomat of Tang Dynasty in 1862. So Fancho, in his writing in 1862, described inhabitants of Jinwin Valley as Zhou, Zhou people. Then after that, Father Vincentius Sangermano used the term Zhou in his book, a description of the Burmese empire which was published in 1833. And T.H. Levin, who was deputy commissioner of Chittagong Hill Trek, who was known as Tangliana by the Lusei, also used the term Zhou. And he mentioned that he came to pick up the term Zhou after he participated in the Lusei expedition of 1871-72 because the people use this term for identifying themselves. And all the ethnic tribes, whether in whichever territory they settle, maintain balanced relationship between religion and politics, even before conversion to Christianity. And many writers, they describe that the pattern of worship practiced by Zhou people as animism. But this was not at all accepted by prominent Zhou scholar and theologian, Reverend Dr. Mangosat Kipgen. Why? Because Zhou people believe in existence of benevolent God known as Patian. Patian. So all tribes of Zhou people, all tribes of Zhou ethnic group believe in the existence of one powerful God who was known as Patian Patien, Mangpa, Pasian. Then they also believe in existence of evil. That evil, known as why, and this evil was said to be classified into 15 different types. Some call it Ramhoi, some call it Gamhoi, some call it Gamhoi Se. In such a way, uh, the existence of evil was also believed. And they practiced different sacrifices. And these sacrifices were performed by the priests known as Puitiam, Tiempu, Siempu. So when people fell ill, the priest Puitiam, Tiempu, or Siempu offer sacrifice to the evil. So that which was with that sacrifice was called in Thoi or Kitoi. And through that, it was expected that the disease may leave the person who was sick. In such a way, there was belief that a person may feel all right, the disease may leave him and may recover from his disease because of performance of that kitoi in toy by the priest, Puitiam. And 
in every zoo settlement, chief was the political head, he was the political authority. And with him was the religious authority. So because of that, there was well balanced relationship between politics and religion. So religion represented by Puitiam and politics represented by the chief. So such was the relationship even before the conversion to Christianity. Due to that, the chief also had high regard for the priest, Puitiam or Tiempo. But the annexation of the inhabited territories, one after another by the British Empire, changed the religious practices of the Zhou people. The British annexation of Zhou territory, however, was not smooth. It was not very smooth and it was not very fast because the British administration was also disturbed to some extent because of annexation in the Zhou territories. So about six, seven wars were fought by the British army in capturing and annexing the Zhou territories of different provinces. So the following wars were fought by the British in the process of annexing Zhou country. First, Lusay Expedition of 1871-72. We know why Lusay Expedition of 1871-72 came up. Because silo chiefs led by Bianquai Silo and Savunga Silo led raid, conducted raid in Alexandra Poti Garden. Then they killed James Winchester the planter, then kid, kidnapped his daughter Mary Winchester, who was six years at the time. And along with that, many tea gardens in Tripura and other castle area were also attacked. So, attack upon tea garden, killing British subject and kidnapping British subject was so much unbearable for the greatest empire of the world at that time. That's why, in order to teach lesson to chiefs of Lusai Hills, Lusai Expedition 1871-72 was undertaken. And as we know, Lusai Hills was attacked from two directions, from Kasar and from Chittagong. And after that, Mary, Mary Winchester was rescued from captivity of Silo Chief. Then, in this expedition, the British authority warned the chiefs not to raid plain area again and to be cooperative to the British authority. So, and the British administration was not that were interested in governing territory which was not at all productive from revenue point of view. That's why they live again. So in this Lusai expedition of 1871-72, some Chakmas also came in the labor corps, but they return again. Due to that, in some writing, it was found that Chakmas stay in Lusai Hills could be dated back to 1871-72. But none of the Chakma who came in the labor corps they remain, they all return to Chittagong again. Then after this Lusai expedition of 1871-72, uh, Raza Gokothang was arrested by Meitei King of Manipur. Then he fought against, uh, as a result of that, and during that time, the King of Manipur was aided by the British army and British authority. And Raza Gokutang also died at Infarzir. Then that was followed by declaration of sovereignty by Chief of Tsasat Tong in 1877. So Eastern part of Manipur 
he declared sovereignty, and in that he was helped by the king of Sanjok. But at last, the king of Manipur could subdue him only with the help of the British army. Then, Jin Dusai expedition of 1889-90. As I've mentioned earlier, after Jin Lusai expedition of 1871-72, British authority won the chief not to raid the plain area again. But raiding the plain area was one of the hobby and heroic act of the chief at that time. So they could not stop. Due to that, chiefs of Jin Hills and Lusai Hills, they frequently raided the plain area, Burmese Plain, Chittagong, Arakan, Kachar, Tripura. And that due to that, many British subjects in the plain area, they were panicked and they had psychological fear. And due to raid of Lakhel chief, Poi chief, and some Dusai chief in Chittagong. In Chittagong, British revenue collection was declining again and again. That's why this Jin Lusai ex expedition of 1889-1890 was undertaken. Jin Hills was attacked from two directions, from North Jin Hills and South Jin Hills. Lusai Hills was attacked from South Lusai Hills and North Lusai Hills. And these Jin Hills and Lusai Hills were kept under British control. And from this territory to territory, British administration started functioning from 1891. But Shizangs and Sukte, they could not accept the defeat at the hands of these British. So Shizang and Sukte continued the rebellion from 1892 up to 1893 and willingly fought against the British. Then after that, after the Sizang and Sute were subdued, there was one chief who didn't want to surrender. He was Haikam chief of Khosak. So Haikam chief of Khosak, if alone fought against the British, and at last he was arrested, I, I, he surrendered, then he was imprisoned in Andaman Nicobar Island. Then next to that, there was Aysen rebellion in 1910, that was led by Cheng Zapao Dongol, who was the chief of Aysan. And after Aysan rebellion was subdued, the last war with the Zhou people fought against the British was Kuki rebellion or Anglo Kuki War of 1917-1919. So British annex annexation in Zhou territory, which started with Lusai expedition of 1871-72 was concluded with Anglo Kuki War of 1917 1919. And wherever the British Empire was established, the British Empire was followed by Christian missionary. And the same was in Zhou country, Zhou inhabited territories also. And there was plan for amalgamation of compact Zhou inhabited territories of. Jin Hills and Lusai Hills into a province. And that was the main agenda of discussion in Jin Lusai Conference, which was held on 29 January 1892 in Kolkata. But in fact, it was decided that Jin Hills and Lusai Hills should be amalgamated into a province administered by chief commissioner or governor. So it was resolved, but it was not materialized again because of the influence of Mackenzie and some other officer. Uh, in such a way, Jin, and Jin Hills and Lusai Hills remain separated. So Jin Hills in Burma, Lusai Hills in Assam, then uh, Chittagong, which was also the inhabited area in Bengal. And because of that, now it is claimed. We are divided. The Zoro claimed that the people were divided because of this Jin Lusai Conference of 29 January 1892. Because of that, 
this day has been observed every year on 29 January by Joro. And with regard to after occupation of the territory, uh, how the missionary came and the missionary followed. So far as Lucy Hills was concerned, Reverend Williams Williams, who was missionary in Hasi Hills, heard a lot about Isor. So he came for a visit as a survey work to Isol in 1891. He stayed in Isol only for seven days, but he could not start any mission to work and he could not do anything. He stayed just for seven days. Then after that, he returned to Hasi Hills. So he just came as a visitor and leave, but observed the situation finding that it will be a good mission field. But this coming of Reverend Williams Williams may not be appropriate to name him as the first missionary because he didn't start any mission work. And after that, J.H. Lorraine and S.W. Savage, who were from Artington Aborigines Mission, read Sairang on 11 January 1894. So, they came not like Williams, Williams, Lorraine and Savitz. They came to settle, to preach the word, the word of God and to do mission work. So their arrival day at Sairang on 11 January 1894 was regarded and observed as missionary day throughout Mizoram. And in fact, this is the right missionary day where missionary who really wanted to work and who started the work step on the soil of Mizoram. And these two missionaries, they stayed only for four years in Lusai Hills because Aborigine Mission, Artington Aborigine Mission was sponsored by Millionaire, Millionaire Artington and his concern was that missionaries should be sent everywhere so that the word of God should be preached. And after that, those believers should take up and preach among their people themselves. That's why after they completed four years in Lusai Hills, they were instructed to move to Nefa, present the Runas of Pradesh. But during their four years stay in Aizor, J.H. Lorraine and Sedwitz, they did many remarkable work. First, they invented Mizo script in Roman alphabet. Then they also, they, they also pick up Mizo language. Then they translated three books of New Testament, Gospel of Luke, Gospel of John and X into Lusay language. But as they got the older, they had no option. So they leave Lusay Hills with heavy heart. And after the Abruzzian mission left, then Wales mission, Wales Calvinistic mission took up the field and the Isons arrived Isol on 31st August 1897 and he began the mission work. And even after the arrival of the Ison, Lorraine and Sedwitz were with him some time and guided him and to know more about the ground situation and after that they left. Then Lorraine, Lorraine and Sedwitz, though they left Aizol, they could not forget they could not forget the Sahils. Then under the initiative of Baptist Missionary Society BMS they were sent again to uh, Lusai Hills, but in the southern part. So they reached Lungley on March 13, 1903. Then they were settled in Selkon. And after that, Regina L. Lorraine 
from local pioneer mission read share call in 1907. So Regner A. Lorraine, he was the younger brother of J.H. Lorraine. So in such a way, North Lusai Hills, South Lusai Hills, and Lakhel area, three di different areas of Lusai Hills were now covered by missionaries. Then in Chin Hills, in the ter territory of Chin Hills, Reverend Carlton, Alter Carlson and his wife, Laura Carlson, reached Chin Hills in 1899 to preach the word of God. So from 1889, 1899, missionary reached Chin Hills. And after that, the word of God began to be spread in different parts of Chin Hills. And Christian missionaries also read and preach in other Zhou territories. Zhou inhabited territory in northern part of Manipur received the gospel of Jesus Christ on 12 December 1914. So on 12 December 1914, three persons, including Song Zopau Kipgen, who was the chief of Tuyang Wai Chung, got baptism. And these, but the day 12 person got baptism was regarded as the day the people of Northern Manipur received the gospel. Then in Southern Manipur, the first village to receive gospel was Senvan village. In Senvan village, Wetkin Al Robot visited and went to Senvan village in 1910 with the invitation of Kamkulun Singh Son, who was the chief of Senvan. So, uh, Zhou people dominated area of North and South of Manipur, they received the gospel. And after that, Zhou inhabited territories in Assam, Tripura, Naga Hills, and Chittagong also received the gospel one after another. In such a way, the worship of unknown God was now replaced by the living God in different territories of the Zhou ethnic group. Then the responsibility of Puitiam Tempu or Siempu was replaced by missionary and pastor. Chief remained chief, but chief was no longer supreme authority like before. Chief then began to have overlord, which was the British Empire. So chief was head of village administration. Then, but he was also under jurisdiction of the British administrator. The relationship of religion and politics, which was represented earlier by priest and chief, then was replaced by relationship of church and state, which was represented by pastor or missionary and chief under British administration. After the conversion of the chief, there was no longer discrimination or relationship between church and state or church and politics also began to be smooth. Okay, concept of secularism, conceptual and constitutional dimension. What is secularism? How secularism came into being? And what is its concept? Now, to many people, our understanding of secularism means freedom of religion, freedom of religion. But what the constitution of India says with regard to definition of secularism? Okay, we'll move point after point. The relationship between church and state automatically led to the evolution of concept of secularism. So the literary meaning of secularism is found in Oxford Advanced Dictionary is the belief that religion should not be involved in society, religion should not be involved in education, religion should not be involved in governance. That means any worldly things should not be touched by religion. So that is the literary meaning of secularism. Then who coined the term secularism and from which year it began to be used. 
the terminology secularism was used for the first time by British writer George Holyoke. And he used it for the first time in 1815. So secularism, secularism was used for the first time by British writer George Holyoke in 1815. Then how did Holyoke interpreted and defined secularism. He defined secularism as separating religion from social order. Hmm. Separating religion from social order. And the term secularism, it is coined recently in modern time. Modern time. The term is used recently, but the concept and idea of this secularism was propagated even in ancient time. See, the term secularism was coined and used by Holyoke in 1815, but the idea of secularism had already been propagated by Sarvaka system of ancient India, which rejected religious practices of the time. And after that, idea of secularism also emerged in the ways among the Greek in city-state, followed by Geno of Citium, then Marcus Aurelius. Then this idea of secularism was further developed during Renaissance period. From 15th to 16th century AD, the idea was further developed. And it was also becoming popular and more propagated during reformation period also from 1517 to 1648. That's why in political terminology, secularism is interpreted as separation of charge from state. So in political terminology, secularism is always interpreted as separation of charge and state. Charles is different, state is different. They have no link. And prominent contractualists, that means contractualists means those political philosophers who propounded social contract theory. Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, and Rousseau. Then among the contractualists, John Locke mentioned about toleration, a letter concerning toleration. In his writing, a letter concerning toleration, he argued against religious toleration, John Locke. And this concept, which he propagated, was further popularized during the age of enlightenment in Europe from 1685. 1815. So the exodus of Puritans from England in search of New Land in America was also due to desire for religious freedom apart from strict control of the state. Thus the concept of secularism was further popularized by enlightenment thinkers, political philosophers like Denise Diderot, Voltaire, Baruch Spinoza, James Madison, Thomas Jefferson, and Thomas Paine. In the United States of America, secularism has been interpreted as separation of charge from state, but some church leaders oppose this concept. Anyway, the Constitution of USA debarred the Congress, that means legislature, to establish a charge, which means official charge and freedom of worship is given to citizens. So, Constitution of USA does not allow the Congress, for, for us it may be parliament, to pass law through which any charge can be declared as official charge. That is not allowed. 
And freedom of worship is given to all the citizens. They can worship any religion. They can follow any religion they want. In England, the king or queen of England is head of the church of England. But still, religious freedom is given to the citizens in the political system. The glorious revolution of 1688 in England further improved this notion and this concept. That's why countries of Europe and America believe in the concept of freedom of religion as interpretation of secularism. So European and American countries believe secularism as freedom of religion, separation of church from state. And some countries which are regarded as constitutionally secular are US, France, Mexico, South Korea, and Turkey. So secularism as separation of church and state or freedom of religion Hello, sir. Uh, Professor Dongo, can you hear me? Uh, it seems like our resource person have some connectivity problems, so hopefully it will be okay in a few minutes. So just bear with us. Let's hope that he'll be with us again shortly. I request to our participants, I request our participants to please bear with us. Our resource person, Professor Dongle, has some connectivity problem and we are trying to resolve it. And we hope to resume the session within a few minutes. Please bear with us.
Our resource person, Professor Dongal, will be joining us shortly. He has some problem with his laptop. His battery has run out, so he'll be with us shortly after plugging in the charger and all. So please bear with us. It will be it will only be a few minutes. We'll resume the session as soon as our resource person join us in this Zoom app. So it would only take a few minutes. While we wait for our resource person to rejoin us, let me make a few announcements regarding the scheduled program for tomorrow night and the day after tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow, we are going to listen to the lecture of Reverend Dr. Ket Hanzawa, Director of Green Hill Public School, ISO, and his topic will be political theology for Mizoram. And on Wednesday night, our resource person is going to be Reverend, Reverend R.C. Reverend R.C. Zongte, MTH, University of Edinburgh, UK, and PhD candidate, Systematic Theology, Princeton Theological Seminary, New Jersey, USA. And the topic for his talk will be the Church of the Poor, Political but Nonpartisan. And on Thursday night, our resource person will be Dr. Ayangbam Shiam Kishore. Associate Professor, Department of Political Science, Missouri University. And his topic is going to be monitoring elections, initiatives, and participation of churches in Missouri. And on the last night, on the last technical session, that is on Friday, Professor Dongel will again be a resource person. And the topic of his talk will be negotiating church state dichotomy, uniqueness of the role of church in Missouri. So that is a program set up for this international webinar and so far prior to the commencement of this program we have 444 registered participants and up until now 232 participants have attended the session we are greatly thankful to all the participants who have registered for this international webinar program as well as the participants who are still with us here during this technical session and we hope that you will all be present throughout the seminar. And I would like to request the participants to not be just a listener to the speeches or lectures of the resource persons. Please ask questions regarding the topic that they are talking about or any other topic, any other, any other questions related to secular or political uh, dichotomy issues in Missouri. So please feel free to drop your question in the Q&A box tonight, as well as in the forthcoming sessions. So we have contacted our resource person, so he'll be joining us shortly after restarting his laptop. It will only be a few minutes, so please bear with us. Sorry for the inconvenience. Okay, sir, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Okay, sir, please continue with your session. Yes, yeah.
Can you be seen, Zara? The slide? Yes, sir. We can see. We can see. Okay. We will continue again. Sorry okay, for sir. the inconvenience. It's okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's about the conversion of those people into Christianity. So as many believe, conversion of those people into Christianity was not that smooth and was not that fast, as many believe. In the initial stage, chiefs of different villages in Lusai Hills and other territories, maybe Manipur, uh, Assam, then Burma, and other parts also, chiefs of villages did not allow their people to be converted to Christianity. Due to that, those villagers, those village people who were converted to Christianity were expelled by the chiefs from the village. Even such happened. And Due to that, this, this type of discrimination by the chief for conversion to Christianity could be found in different territories occupied by the Zhou people in the initial state. Then this type of incidents also led to establishment of Setrun, known as Patian Kua or God's village. And after that from Setrun, those believer they moved to Tehria. This happened in South Mizoram, near Lungle. That's why after conversion to Christianity, the worship of unknown God was then replaced by living God in different territories of the Zoatic group. Then the role of Puitiam was replaced by missionary and pastor. Chief remained as chief, but Chief, who was supreme authority earlier, began to have overlord, which was the British Empire. The chief who was head of village administration earlier, now he administered the village under the jurisdiction of the British administrators. That's why the relationship of religion and politics, which was represented earlier by priest and chief, was then replaced by relationship of church and state, which was represented by pastor and missionary and chief under British administration. But after the conversion of all the chiefs to Christianity, there was no longer discrimination and there was no longer harsh relationship between church and state or church and politics. So the process began to be smooth. Okay, <clears throat> this, I think this we have already discussed. We, we have touched concept of secularism. Hmm. So, okay. Secularism is separation of church and state or freedom of religion is not the concept which is enshrined in the Constitution of India. And one thing that you have to know is that the Constitution of India carefully avoided the word secular and secularism in the Constitution. Till the, and, till the enactment of Constitution 42nd Amendment Act 1976. So the word secular or secularism is not mentioned in the original constitution, but secular ideas, secular concept, religious freedom, religious protection could be found in fundamental rights. In part three of the constitution of India, in article 15, article 25, article 26, article 27, article 28, article 29, one and article 30 of the constitution of India. So 
religious rites concerning wording concerning religion are incorporated in these articles that we have to uh, look at it one after another. So the Constitution 42nd Amendment Act 1976, at the time when Prime Minister Indira Gandhi was the Prime Minister, this 42nd Amendment Act 1976 added three new words in the preamble, preamble to the Constitution of India. Then what are the three new words? Socialist, secular, and integrity. So before the enactment of, before the inclusion of secular in the preamble, secular was not a constitutional word because it was not inserted anywhere in the constitution of India. But since its inclusion in the preamble by amendment of this 42nd Amendment Act 1976, secular then become a constitutional one. And before that, one thing what we have to know is that two important words, the theories have been incorporated, but the two words which are which were carefully avoided in the constitution of India were secular and federalism. India is a federal structure. By structure, India is federal. Indian federalism comprise of state at the union government and state at the state level. A government at the union level and government at the state level. Then as federal structure, in seven central of the constitution of India, there are division of powers between the union government and the state government, which are characterized into three least, least one union government, least two for state government, then least three concurrent least, which can be used both by the union and government and the state government. So in this seven schedule, we find that the structure is federal. Then the setup of government is also federal. Government at the state and government at the union. But the word federal is nowhere mentioned, nowhere written in any part of the constitution of India up till now. Likewise, this word secular or secularism was also avoided wisely, but it was added. It has been added by 42nd Amendment Act of 1976. Now we shall go after the constitutional provision. So with regard to religion, what are the provisions inserted in the constitution of India? Starting from article 15. Article 15, prohibition of discrimination on the ground of religion, race, caste, sex, or place of birth. That means there shall not be discrimination from the government there shall not be discrimination from the public. There shall be no discrimination from the state on the ground of religion, number one. No discrimination on religion, Article 15. Then Article 15 one says what? Does not allow the state to show discrimination on the ground of religion, race, caste, sex, or place of birth. That means Article 15, one, clause one, restrict the state to show favoritism or to discriminate someone on the basis of religion. Then what did Article 15, two says? Article 15, two does not allow citizens to show discrimination on the ground of religion, race, caste, sex, or place of birth. So, Article 15 is about prohibition on discrimination. And Article 15, one prohibition is for the state. The state should not show any discrimination on the ground of religion. Then Article 15, two is about the citizens. Citizens also should not show any discrimination on the ground of religion. Then Article 25. Freedom of conscience and free profession, practice and propagation of religion. That means Article 25 has given the freedom of conscience, free profession, 
free practice and free propagation of religion. Having said that, freedom of conscience, free profession, free practice, and free propagation of religion have been incorporated in Article 25. But in Article 25.1, it says, subject to public order, subject to public order, morality and hell, and in line with other provisions of the constitutions. All persons are equally entitled to freedom of conscience and the right freely to profess, practice and propagate religion. That means the right and the freedom to profess, practice and propagate religion should not disturb public order, morality and health of the society. So a restriction is given, even in that regard. Then in Article 26, what is mentioned? In Article 26, freedom to manage religious affairs on what? Religious affairs can be managed by any religious group subject to public order, morality, health, every religious domination or any section thereof shall have the right. Hmm. That means every religion, every, every religious denomination or every religious group have the right, but that right shall be subject to public order, morality, and hair. Then what are the rights given to religious community to establish and maintain institutions for religious and charitable purposes? Then to manage its own affairs in matters of religion. All religion can manage its own affairs without interference from the state. Then to own and acquire movable and immovable property. Any religious group can own movable and immovable property. Then any religious group can administer property in accordance with law. So such freedom are given in Article 26. But as I have said, it is not unlimited freedom. There are certain restrictions subject to public order, morality, and health. Then Article 27, freedom is to payment of taxes for promotion of any particular religion. That means tax cannot be paid by citizens. The payment of which will promote a particular religion. Tax cannot be paid by citizens for promotion of particular Hindu religion. Tax cannot be paid by citizens for promotion of particular Muslim religion or tax cannot be paid by citizens for promotion of particular Christian religion. That means religious tax in any form is not allowed by Article 27. Then, other than this, any person should not be compelled to pay any taxes. The process of which will be beneficial for a particular religion or religious group in the long run. That's why religious tax payment on the basis of payment of tax on the basis of religion is totally bare by this Article 27. Then Article 28, freedom is to attendance at religious instruction or religious worship in certain educational institution. So in some institution, religious instruction may be imparted, but the one who has to attain, he has his own freedom, he can or he cannot, that is his choice. Then Article 28.1, no religious instruction shall be provided in any educational institution only maintained out of state fund. That means in any educational institution, whether it be primary school, middle school, high school, higher secondary, college or university, if the institution is wholly maintained by 
fund of the state, no religious instruction shall be provided. This is restricted in Article 28.1. Then in Article 28.3, no person attending any educational institution recognized by the state or receiving aid out of the state funds shall be required to take part in any religious instruction that may be imparted in such institution or in any premises attached thereto, unless such person or if such person is a minor, his guardian has given his consent thereto. That means in any educational institution, which may be partly funded by the state, If religious instruction is imparted, that is the responsibility and right of the student either to join or not to join. So it is his choice. This is clearly mentioned. Then Article 29, two, no citizen shall be denied admission into any educational institution maintained by the state or receiving aid out of the state funds on ground only of religion, race, caste, language, or any of them. That means in any educational institution, what Article 29.2 means is that in any educational institution maintained by the state, admission shall not be denied to any person on the ground of religion. On religious ground, admission shall not be denied. Then, Article 30, right of minorities to establish and administer educational institutions. So, minorities are given the freedom. Minorities have the right to establish and administer educational institutions. Then, what is minority? How minority is defined? How the Constitution of India defines minority? This is clearly given in Article 30, Clause 1. In Article 31, what is minority? It is defined here. So, one thing that you have to know is that many at time, there are many intellectuals who misinterpreted and who misdefined minority. Minority cannot be Minority cannot be defined on the basis of tribal identity. But constitution has provided only two factors, only two characteristics for definition of minority. That is religion and language. So in Article 30, Clause 1, it is clearly mentioned that minority shall be defined only on the basis of religion and language. Minority may be religious minority or linguistic minority, but not on the basis of tribe or tribal identity. This and that minority cannot be defined. Then in Article 32, the state shall, in granting aid to educational institution, discriminate against any educational institution on the ground that it is under the management of minority whether based on religion and language. So in Article 31, minority is clearly defined. Then in Article 32, state that is given minority institution. That means any educational institution which is established and managed by the minority shall not be discriminated. So, the constitutional provision about the concept and definition of secularism has been highlighted in Article 15, Article 25, Article 26, 27, 28, 29, 2, and 30. So in all these highlight, in all these provision highlighted by this article number, from here, it can be known that secularism in the context of India enshrines equal treatment of all religions. So it is not freedom of religion. 
many understand it as freedom of religion. That is the Western concept, but not secularism in the constitution of India. In the constitution of India, secularism means equal treatment of all religions, no special treatment shall be given to a particular religion, and no discrimination shall be shown to a particular religion. So secularism means equal treatment of all religions. But the provision of secularism in the Constitution of India from Article 15 to 30 also, Article 15.25 to 30 also, does not highlight or does not indicate about separation of religion from politics or separation of church from state. It is not. But what secularism defines and what secularism contains is that equal treatment of all religion. That's why the concept of secularism in the Constitution of India does not indicate freedom of religion, but equal treatment of all religions in India. No religious groups should be discriminated and no religious groups should be given special privilege. And secularism in the context of Constitution of India also does not mean irreligion non-religion, atheism, but it stands for equal treatment of all religion. Okay, charge-state relationship in Mizoram. Priest and chief relationship in pre-conversion era is now replaced by missionary, pastor, and Chief all British administrator relationship. Then religion and politics also change into church and state after conversion to Christianity. Church remain the same, but agency representing state was different in different period. So in pre-independent era, state was represented by the chief and British administrator. Then during district council era, State was presented by represented by district council. Then, after union territory, state was represented by union territory government. Then, after statehood, state was represented by state government. And state and statehood, this is different. In the in political theory, every independent country is called state. But when we talk about Mizoram state, that is province under the arrangement of constitution of India. So that should also be understood. That's why this charge relationship in Mizoram, we shall discuss it in briefly in different periods, four different periods. First, starting with pre-independent era. As I've said, relationship between religion and politics was replaced by relationship between charge and state all church and politics after conversion to Christianity. So the gospel of Christ was pitched to the people of Lucy Hills by Artington Aboriginal Mission, Baptist Missionary Society, and Local Pioneer Mission. And all these mission agency, they established, established stable church. Then, other than this Press Between Charles being founded by Archington uh, uh, Calvinist, Wales Calvinist Mission, Baptist Charles being founded by Baptist Missionary Society, then Independent Charles of Maryland or an Evangelical Charles of Maryland being founded by Local Pioneer Mission. There were also other established stars before independence. Salvation Army, Roman Catholic, and Seventh-day Adventists, which were declared as established stars till 1949. So, in the initial stage, there was good coordination between missionary and political officer Later, political officer was known as superintendent. And superintendent or political officer also 
listen to advice of the missionary. And administration also benefit the medical laws. When Sir Bamsby Fuller, Chief Commissioner of Assam, visited Dusa Hills in February 1904, he found that mission schools were better organized than government schools. That's why through his work, schools were amalgamated and handed over to Christian missionary, which remained under them even after independence after 1952. But funds were provided by the administration for managing the school and for payment of the school teachers from time to time. So in such a way, the missionary supervised the school and did a lot of work which also lessened the burden of the administration. And in fact, educational and medical work of the missionary also relieved the administration of, so, of major administrative and financial burden. And along with that, missionaries were not satisfied only in education and medical work. They also touched upon the social system, social evils, Missionaries found that continuous use of Jew spoiled the Christian spirit of the Zhou people. That's why missionary discouraged Jew liquor, and missionary also discouraged practice of Zolbu, and missionaries also discouraged unhygienic way of life. Because earlier, a uh, wooden plate was used for eating food, and sometimes those wooden plates were not washed at all. Then even the pigs and hens and dogs also sell the wooden plate with the family. Such situation. Missionaries. And the steps taken by the missionaries with regard to uh, Jew, Zolbu, and improving the hygienic way of life of the people was also supported. We're also relieved of, relieving of the church workers from coolie work also could be regarded as respects of church and church worker by the British administration. displease the British administration. The main the main agency through which British Empire governed the Lusaiers. That's why the British administration did not want to displease the chief. And the campaign for this abolition of boy system was vigorously pursued by medical missionary Dr. P. Fraser. But Fraser was the only missionary who went a bit extreme. Other missionaries also supported him, but they were not as adamant and they were not as ferocious as he did. And because of his intensified campaign for putting an end to this voice system, Dr. Fraser had differences with the superintendent of Lusa Hills, Lieutenant Colonel HWZ Cole. And after the turf presser could not agree to the term 
which was laid down by superintendent, he was expelled from Dusai Hills in 1911. And even after he was expelled from Dusai Hills, he, he returned to England. He continued the campaign here in England. Then in England, he was also supported by Mary Winchester, who was rescued by the Southern Column from captivity of silo chiefs in 1872. By the time she was a grown up and she was also one of the main campaigner. And due to that, this boy system or slavery was abolished by British Parliament in 1913. During British rule in pre-independent era, Charles and administration coordinated well and cooperated properly, except on the issue of abolition of slavery. The British administrators in Lusa Hills, they were overall in charge of administration, but village administration was undertaken by the chief with knowledge of the superintendent. So, The church established by missionaries rendered a lot of help to administration in education, medical facility, and in stoppage of many social evils. Okay, then district council era. So the gospel and Western education which people of those high hills obtained from missionaries awakened them politically also. And that political awareness inculcated the zeal for participation in activities. As a result of that, the first political party was formed with the permission of Superintendent McDonald by R. Van Loma on 9 April 1946. And this Mizo Union was regarded as anti chief party. And the formation of Mizo Union was followed by formation of AMFO, United Mizo Freedom Organization by Lalbi Akhtanga, the first Mizo postgraduate on 5th July 1947. And the third political party to be formed was Poi Lakal Tribal Union on 26th of October 1949. So, MU, AMFO, and PLTU were the three first political party formed in Dusai Hills when the district council was about to be created and created. Then, with regard to this election, McCall conducted district chief Dalbury election in 1940 and McDonald conducted district conference election in 1946, but both were not democratic election. And the first democratic election was experienced in Lusai Hills Advisory Council election of 23rd, April, 23rd March 1948 and 15 April 1948. Then this advisory council was again changed into advisory committee on 24 July 1950. And this advisory committee and later on advisory, this advisory council on and later on advisory committee acted as provisional district council till the inauguration of district council. So Lusa Hills Autonomous District Council was inaugurated by Bishnu Ram Medi, Chief Minister of Assam and Aizal on 26 April 1952. And after that, the name Lusa Hills Autonomous District Council was changed into Missouri District Council by amendment of the sixth schedule by parliament in 1954 because the term Lusai was said to be not inclusive and not including many other Zo ethnic tribes. Because of that, with that aim in mind, this name of the district council was changed into Missouri District Council. And Mizo District Council tried to revise some customary practices, which were restricted earlier by the missionaries. So, those people have different types of festivals or coup, like Chapsarkut, 
Chapukut, Minkut, Polkut, Favangkut, Chavangkut, Sipuiroi, Lukra, Huado, and there are many others also. All can, can, could not be named. Then, Mizo District Council took the initiative for revival of three kuts, Chapsarkut, Polkut, and Minkut, but it was not welcome at all by the church. And Chapsarkut celebration was held from 1960 to 1963, but after a bottle of dew was displayed in the celebration, church opposite. And due to plea of the church, Chapsarkut celebration was discontinued from 1965, and it was not revived the whole during the whole district council days. And it was revived only after the Union Territory in 1973. And by that time, by that time the, of discontinuation of the Chapsarkut celebration, MNF intensified its movement. MNF promulgated unilateral declaration of independence of Mizoram on 1st March 1966, and Lusai Hills was declared as disturbed area. And in position of this disturbed area, also disturbed the functioning of both stars and district council. Under the initiative of press between stars, Synod Standing Committee Resolution of March 12, 1966. Isor Citizens Committee with 18 members was formed. Then after that, the teachers of Mizoram also initiated and formed Lumley Citizens Committee with 25 members on March 21, 1966. Then with the participation of both BCM and Presbyterian leaders, Christian Peace Committee was formed on 14 July 1966. And this Peace Committee met MNF leaders four times between 1966 to 1969 and met central government leaders in 1967, but no much progress was achieved. So the remaining period of Missouri District Council existence was under disturbance and normally Mizo District Council election was to be conducted in 1967, but it was also not possible because of abnormal law and order situation. And due to that, Mizo District Council election was conducted four years after the normal timing in 1970. That's why during the whole District Council days era, both Charles and District Council functioning was disturbed. Okay, Union Territory era. Union Territory of Mizoram was inaugurated on January 21st, 1972, as enacted by the Northeastern Area Reorganization Act 1971. But even after the declaration of Union Territory, disturbance continued. And during this time, Presbyterian Church issued election communique to voters who were their church members for election of members of legislative assembly in 1972, 1977, 1979, and 1983 during UT era. And election communique issued by the press was effectively pursued by Synod Executive Committee, one powerful committee of the press between chairs. And as per the SEC meeting resolution of July 7, 1982, the SEC called meeting of all newly elected MLS, interacted with them, and present them, presented them Holy Bible in the same year. By this time, quick Mizoram notice was issued to non Mizo. Why of Mizoram by MNF twice in 1979 and 1982, respectively. And this quit Mizoram notice also led to killing of some non Mizo within Mizoram. And there was also reaction from outside Mizoram. Under the initiative of Presbyterian Church and Baptist Church of Mizoram, 
Zoram Kohran Roy to Committee ZKHC letter, Mizoram Kohran Roy to Committee MKHC was formed in 1982. The MKHC pursued the peace initiative and it sent letters to MNF leaders and met Pulalenga in 1982. The MKHC leaders also attempted to meet Prime Minister twice in 1982, but it failed. Despite these many holders, the MKHC patiently pursued the peace initiative by repeatedly keeping contact with both MNF leaders and government of India. So the continuous effort of the MKHC bore fruit, which led to the signing of Mizoram Accord on 30 June 1986, after two decades insurgency. So in this Mizoram Accord, Aldi Pradhan, the then Home Secretary signed on behalf of the Government of India, Lalkham Chief Secretary on behalf of Government of Mizoram, and Lal Denga President on behalf of MNF. And after that, 20 years insurgency came to an end, only due to efforts of the Charles leaders. Okay, statehood era. The relationship between Charles and state is also called here during statehood era, except on the issue of Jew, except on the issue of liquor. So, the state respects and uphold the advice of the church and the church also support the state. That's why there was good working relationship between the church and the state. And the church also felt that it was its duty to help the state. So the Tsar's leaders felt that as given in Romans chapter 13, verse 1, everyone must obey the state authorities because no authority exists without God's permission. And the existing authority have been put here by God. So this is one of the principles followed by the church, the biblical principle. That's why the church wants to cooperate and the church wants to beg the state for good governance. The church began to oppose the state when it is not biblical. The church enormously contributes by creating awareness to its members on duties of citizens, duties of government, on good governance, on education reform, on, and in the fight against social leaders. Then the Presbyterian Church, BCM, and other Church denominational associations regularly issued election communique to its members in every election and asked their members to cast their vote and to refrain from unfair practices. In fact, this community issued by the church also really influence and guide the members in the right direction. Mizoram is highly praised from before due to free and fair voting. And election violence was never hard even during insurgency period. That's why, compared to other states, Mizoram is preach worthy. Like even some Christian state like Nagaland, how election is unclean, nobody can say. Because at the time when I was BA student in Patkai Christian College in 1991, in Kohima, in MLA election, one vote was sold at 1,000 that I knew it clearly. But 
when we come when we compare to Mizoram, there is no sign of vote selling. There is no sign of uh, vote buying, no election related violence, then no unfairness. That's why Mizoram is highly praised in this regard. And even during intensified insurgency also, there was no election related violence. However, some untoward development seems to be taking place in state legislative assembly election of 2003. And that really alarmed the Charles leaders. And because of that, the Charles leaders did not want the ongoing status quo of free and fair election Mizoram to be disturbed. And due to initiative taken by Charles and some civil societies, Mizoram People Forum as an election watchdog began to be formed in 2006. And it is now the best election watchdog all over India. In 2013, in the month of February, I presented Mizoram People Forum as my paper title in International Seminary in Allahabad University. And many were interested and they feel amazed and they asked me, any such good thing ha could happen in India? Yeah, I told them it happened in the state of Mizoram through the initiative taken by church and church leaders, I told them. That's why Mizoram is now applauded, Mizoram is now recognized, and Mizoram is praised mainly because of this responsibility of MPF. That's why after statehood, the relationship between church and state was peaceful and good call order relationship has also been maintained except on the issue of liquor. The church had some differences with state on the issue of liquor twice in 1988 and 2018. So far as this liquor prohibition is concerned, prohibition order of liquor was issued for the first time in Mizoram at the time when it was Lucy Hills District by KZR Iyer, Deputy Commissioner of Lucy Hills in March 1954. Then after Indian Territory, the Mizo Union government introduced the Mizoram Excise Bill 1973. And by this Mizoram Excise Bill 1973, the import of Indian made liquor without permission was forbidden. It was not allowed. And after that, in the Mizoram Excise Rules 1983, which was enacted during Congress government, provision was provided for issue of license for selling liquors. So some person who got the license, they opened the wine shop and started selling wine liquor in bazaar. Then what was the impact? The impact was not good in society. It led to increase in the number of drunkards, it led to disturbance in society and in many locality. That's why Presbyterian Church, BCM, and other church denomination raised the rise government for enforcement of total prohibition of liquor. The Senate Executive Committee of Presbyterian Church met Pulalena after he was sworn in as Chief Minister on July 25, 1986, regarding total prohibition, and met him again on April 5, 1988. But state government did not take up any, measure, any measures in this line as expected by the Church. That's why. The church, particularly Synod Executive Committee, vigorously pursued the agenda for implementation. With regard to this opposition of 
required by the charge. What was the issue of the charge? What, what did the charge say? Number one, required permits made drinking of liquor very common. It increased drinkers and it led to more disasters. Point number one. Then point number two, liquor was one of the social evils and related to drug abuse. Point number three, the effect of liquor on individual and social life was more than the income through tax on liquor permit and liquor itself. So because of this constant pressure from the press between Charles and other Charles, MNF government led by Laldena is stand opposition from the Charles for not taking initiative in total prohibition of liquor. And during that time, because of factional fight, MNF government could not complete its full term. Then mid term poll was held in 1989 and Congress government led by Lal Thanola was formed and the Tsars continued to pressurize the new state government for enforcement of total prohibition of liquor, but it was not materialized in the time. Then next, next election was here in 1993. Then Congress formed government again. And after repeated reminder by the Tsars in general and SEC in particular, Congress government led by Lal Tanhola enacted Mizoram Total Prohibition Act 1995. So the pressure began very early. The pressure began from the Union Territory days, but it was enacted only in 1995. Pierre Kindia, governor of Mizoram, assented the bill and became an act on January 31, 1996. And the Tsars welcomed this total prohibition. However, the same Congress government led by Lal Thanhola changed this total liquid, this Mizoram liquid total prohibition act into Mizoram liquid prohibition act 2018. And the Tsars to the near opposed action of the government. In such a way, the church, which was so happy and which so welcome, the step taken up by Congress government led by Lal Thanhola in 1995 was to the near opposing his second action in 2018. Okay, critical evaluation of Charles-State relationship. The Charles-State relationship occupies important discourse of political thinkers and political philosophers since early Christian era. And Charles-State relationship also happened to be the main important agenda of discussion in many Christian discourses. Christian philosophers such as Christian political philosophers such as St. Augustine, St. Ambrose, Pope Galatius, Pope Gregory VIII, and other important philosopher saints propagated the relationship between Tsars and state. And many they wrote also. The relationship has also been propounded by proponents of secularism in the ways a separation of church and state and of state in religious affairs. The discourse is continuing and some debates can also be found in the present Mizoram political system. Some critics criticize the role of the state, but some critics criticize the role of the church. Frankly speaking, the church and state experience good relationship except on the issue of liquor. The church was quite critical about the role of state government with regard to liquor issue of MNF government led by Laldenga in 1988 
And the same situation was repeated in the liquor policy of Congress government led by Nalthan Hola in 2018. So, after he gave up, Twenty years, and both the ruling party of 1988 and the ruling party of 2018, respectively, they exited from political power in the next election. Some critics <clears throat> were apprehensive about the role of the chairs in blocking. Revenue generation of the state with regard to revenue from the sale of the square. The just clarified and boldly stated that it is the duty of the church to oppose anything was against biblical teaching. Church also clarified that liquor in any form could not and would not be accepted by the church. So. The Tsars and the Tsars leaders are so stubborn in this regard because they say that it is biblical. It is based on the teaching of Bible. That's why Tsars leaders openly spoke against the equal policy of the government and some political leaders even openly criticized Tsars leaders in media briefing and praise conference actually which could be and which should be avoided. Total prohibition was fulfilled by the new MNF government led by Zauram Tanga, which has been formed after legislative assembly election of 2018. Even now, debate is still going on with regard to this liquid prohibition. Some still say that Tsars cross its limit, but many say Tsars has, Tsars has done what it has to do. So ongoing debate is there. The critics also point out that use of government resources like vehicle, property, building without payment by Tsars amount to violation of provision of fundamental rights in the constitution of India. Then the proactive participation of some, some church associations in awareness campaign for political awareness, good governance, fight against corruption, duties of citizens, and in election related issue have also been criticized by the critics. And even some church association also are apprehensive about it. Like the initiatives taken by the church led to formation of MPF. And as I've mentioned, MPF is the best election watchdog in line with modern con code of conduct of the ECI right now. But even some church association, many, many, even some church association cannot be in one voice with other, even with regard to MPF. In fact, the role of MPF should not be politicized. The role of MPF should not be particularized as step taken by specific church, but it should be applauded and supported and encouraged by one and all, all the church and civil society. In fact, the electoral system of Mizoram is now praised mainly because of the contribution of MPF. And even the Election Commission of India gives every excellent comment about the role and contribution of MPF for conducting free and fair election in Mizoram. And now, another one issue with regard to church and state. The, involve, the involvement of serving and retired pastor in active politics is also another hot topic of discussion in 
Mizoram political system right now. Some critics point out that participation of serving and retired pastor in active politics pollute the sanctity of the church, but on the other hand, many clarified that the participation of pastors in active politics is necessary for purification of politics in line with biblical teaching. So it is a complex issue to be to comment. And it is a very difficult general observation to be given also. But there was participation of pastor in politics in the past. Mention can be made of Reverend Jesse M. Nichols Roy, who was a tall leader of tribal in the Northeast, who was ordained minister in the Church of God, who, who married American lady missionary. And at the time when many Northeast tribal did not know where Australia, Europe, and America really exist or not, he already traveled all these continents and countries before the First World War, preaching the word of God. So, so far as the Reverend J.M. Nichols Roy was concerned, though he was a pastor, he was a nationalist by heart. That's why he didn't want to remain in the United States of America. So from United States of America, he returned to India. <clears throat> Even his first daughter was born a while they set her in USA. And by, by, by the time they reached London, <clears throat> they missed their ship by a few minutes. And the ship which they missed was attacked by German Navy in Pacific Ocean, and many people died. And in India, the news spread that Reverend Zazian Nichols Roy was killed. So after he came to know the news, that's what came into his mind. God had a purpose for sparing my life. What will be that purpose? So he returned to his Sela village in Khasi Hills. He continued his pastoral work there. Then besides being pastor, he was also concerned with social work. He fought against social evils. Then to uplift the socioeconomic condition of people of the area with the help of agronomists. He tested soil of the area, and from that soil testing, it was proved that the area may be good for orange farming, orange cultivation. So he encouraged people of the area to do orange farming. Then in order that there will be no marketing problem, he signed agreement with some company in Kolkata who would take all the products. So as a result of orange farming, many people in Hasi Hills, they became rich, and he himself also became rich because of orange farming. Then he also fought against many social evils. And during that time, Hasi Zentia Hills was partially excluded area. And as partially excluded area, they had representatives. They could send representatives in the some legislative assembly. So he was invited to contest MLA election. But he gave one condition. He could contest and become MLA provided. He could continue with his pastoral work. Then he was elected MLA for the first time in 1921. And he remained MLA till his death in 1959. Then after that, Governor of Assam invited him to become cabinet minister. But he gave one condition. He could accept the post of cabinet minister, provided he could continue with his pastoral work. And Governor could not take this decision. So he asked for opinion of Governor General. Then Governor General again sent to sent for opinion of the Queen of England. Then after it was decision was taken, he was inducted as cabinet minister. And even in government, he continued to write his name as Reverend Jesse M. Nichols Roy. He was cabinet minister of some four times under Sadola and Bordeloy. He was member of the Constituent Assembly and he was member of 
Northeast Frontier Assam Tribal and Excluded Area Subcommittee. And he contributed a lot for people of Northeast India. And he was the one who met the Simon Commission when they visited India and submitted memorandum. And he was also the one who submitted memorandum to a team of three British cabinet ministers led by Stafford Cribbs, whole cabinet mission in 1946. Stafford Cribbs, Patrick Lawrence, and A.V. Alexander, three British cabinet ministers came in 1946 to look for handing over of administration and governance to India. And during that time, Reverend Jesiam Nicholas Roy submitted one memorandum. Then what did he mention in that memorandum? We tribal peoples were independent people. We, we, we were neither under our homes, nor Hindu, nor Muslim rulers. But you British came, you demarcated us within the province of Assam, and now you will be leaving us. So are you leaving us to be discriminated in this manner as they wanted by the plain Hindus and Muslims, or will you lay down some constitutional guidelines so that we may be able to protect ourselves? And as a result of that, just before the cabinet mission team leave for London, they called press conference and instructed constant assembly to create advisory committee. Then advisory committee was formed. And from that advisory committee, so three, three more advisory committee were formed. And in such a way, protects, constitutional protection of the tribals in the constitution of India, the Sikh schedule and ADC was created. That was the brainchild of this Reverend Jaziam Nichols Roy. So with regard to Reverend Jaziam Nichols Roy, it was in fact not his interest, but he was called by the people. He was invited by the people. Then the people promoted him until he continued with his pastoral work and remain MLA till his death, and he contributed a lot also. That's why many pastors can also perform like him, but is the situation conducive? And is the situation the same with the time of the W. Reverend Jensen Nichols Roy? So, Charles and state should cooperate and respect its other domain. Sir, state cannot function efficiently without cooperation of the church. And it is also biblical duty of the church to cooperate with the state. In such a way, the church should give constructive advice to the state for good governance, which should also be valued by the state. Church and church leaders should avoid one-sided involvement for benefit of a particular party. But if church leader or ordained minister is a, rest, is a register member in a particular party, that is well and good. But for serving church leader or for church, it is better not to be identified with a particular party or a particular policy. Likewise, political leaders should also avoid open criticism and open, leader, open challenge of church leaders and church in press briefing or public speech because church leaders are agent of the living God. That's why as church leaders are agent of the living God, they should also be respected. That's why both church and state should cooperate for speedy development of the society. Okay, we shall come to the conclusion. So all human civilizations and human societies in ancient, medieval and modern experience relationship between religion and politics. The spread of Christianity transformed these relationship into church and state in Western country, which led to evolution of the concept of secularism. Ethnic group also had religion and political relationship since pre-colonial era, but after the conversion to Christianity, 
that relationship changed into charge state relationship. That's why even among the Zoe ethnic group, charge state relationship came up. So the concept of Western concept of not the concept in the constitution of India. The concept of secularism in the constitution of India is equal treatment of all religions. No religion should be discriminated, no religion should be given special privileges. So Mizoram also experienced Tsar state relationship from pre in pre-independent era, district council era, UT era, and statehood era. Some controversy issues grow up, particularly with regard to issue of Jew require. But the contribution of the church for restoration of peace and normalcy in Mizoram should not be forgotten. So the progress of society depends upon. Therefore, church and state should perform each other's duties without interfering upon the domain of others. However, guidance and advice should be given by church to the state. The church should avoid involvement in political nature of any issue for benefit of a single political party or single politicians. On the other hand, political leaders should also avoid open criticism and open challenge of stars and stars leaders. As stars and state are equally important for balanced growth of human civilization, they should have good working relationship and should cooperate fruitfully even in the days to come. Okay, thank you. Thank you all for your patient hearing. Now may I hand over the time to our host, Dr. Zardo Saga. Okay, thank you, sir for that informative and very insightful session, sir. And we have already exceeded our time limit by one hour and 45 minutes. And sir, we have three questions for you here, if you can access it from the Q&A box. I'll read out for the participants and sir, you can answer it after I read out the question. Uh, the first question is my simple question to the speaker. The speaker need to correct some minor error like Paite and Paite, both the term refer to the same group of people, but the speaker use it to mean different people. Also Paite and the people of Tedim are the same people. Wish the speaker could make some clarification. So that is the first question. Can you see the question, sir, from the Q&A box? Yeah, yeah. OK. Actually, uh, yeah, that is more or less the same, understandable. But uh, based on government records, and as I've said, though ethnic groups, we are now divided into three sovereign countries, and even the, among the three sovereign countries also into many states again. That's why if it is written as Paite, in some states, in the tribe recognition, it is recognized as Paite. But if it is uh, written as Tidim Chin, that means in a particular, maybe in foreign country or in that, uh, it is recognized as Tidim Chin. That's why the nomenclature which is used in a particular area in a particular province uh, cannot be neglected or cannot be just forgotten but yeah it is a fact that the it is the same tribe using more or less the same, same language that i also know it quite well but depending upon how it is listed in the tribe list on the basis of that it is written okay sir uh, let's proceed to the next question. Sir, may I know on what ground is 
Chin Lung, Xin Lung, Kur, Kul, etc., considered to be located in South China, in spite of the fact that there is no historical evidence or scientific proof to ascertain your claim. No doubt it is commonly agreed that this cave must be must have been located in Southeast Asia. Yeah, uh, I also mentioned that it is believed. I don't say it is. It is believed to be. So the oral tradition and the oral history, which has been passed down from generation to generation by our forefathers. I am repeating that oral history only. That's why uh, I don't say that it is, but it is belief based on the how this is. It may be somewhere. That's why. But the thing that we have to know is that for the Chinlung origin or Kul origin people, it is the concept which bind us. It is the concept which put us together. That's why in that concept it is used. But so far as the origin and the location, even that South Asia also, there is no exact proof, there is no authentic, authentic proof. But what we have to understand is that Chinlung, whether it be in China or Burma or Southeast Asia or wherever it is, the thing is that it is our place of origin and that binds us together. That is the significant point. Okay, so this is the last question for this session. According to your view, do you think that the church, especially the elders, are giving biased support to the ZPM party? And do you think that and do you think that mentioning about political overtones on pulpit by church elders about giving support to ZPM in the Will you finish the question, Zara? Hello? Sir, can you hear me? Yeah, please repeat it. Yeah. Please repeat the question. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can hear you. Okay, okay, yeah, I, I know the gist of the question. Okay, let me carry on. Yeah, uh, there has been a lot of talks on saying that that PM has been supported by chairs. But if, like, if a particular church decided that in the church assembly that such and such party may be supported. Can it be regarded as support by church? Like some elders, some upas, or some church leaders, personally, they may be in favor of a particular party. They may propagate it. That is their personal view. So if it is to be regarded a support by church. At least decision might have been taken in deal or in pastorate, synod, or in some lever. But such decisions have been not adopted at lever, but there may be certain individuals who uh, cross the limit in may be preaching in the pulpit or mentioning in front of the church members. That should be counted as initiative taken by individuals. But if church did not pass resolution in bill level or pastor, uh, like in synod lever or in other lever, I think it may not be appropriate to claim that 
Charles has support such and such party. It is, it may be, it should be regarded as the work and initiative of certain individuals, not Charles as a whole. Okay, sir, there are two more questions. Uh, I'll the groups. That is the fourth question. Any more question? Zara? Yes, sir. There are two more questions. Uh, the fourth question is, sir, do you think that the Chakmas and Bruce are within the ambit of Zo ethnic groups? Completely no. They are not within the Zo ethnic group. Had they been within the Zhou ethnic group, I may include it in the R group or Z group. Historical origin is different. They are not from Chinlu. And Bru and Chakma, they don't have any linguistic affinity with any of the Zhou ethnic group. Actually, they are migrants who settle here. That's why they are not within the Zhou ethnic group. But from time to time, some politicians without knowing the history deeply, tell them that you should become Mizo. We told them to become Mizo, but they don't become. In such a way, they are not Zhou ethnic group by blood. If they are not Zhou ethnic group by blood, by social or politics, they cannot. What is going on now in some parts of Northeast? See, uh, light in Manipur, some Zhou ethnic group like Maring, Anal, Moyon, Monsang, and all. They are Zhou ethnic group by blood. But through political pressure, the NSC and Nayam, they try to naganize them. Such state is taken. But they cannot achieve 100% success because by blood they are not Nagas. Likewise, even if we try to include these Chakma and Bru in the Zhou ethnic group, they are not Zhou ethnic group, they are by blood, it, it will not be possible. But we have to accept them as people of Mizoram, but they are not within the Zhou ethnic group. And in this regard, when I attended refresher course in Manipur University in 2008, the resource person, he delivered lecture then he mentioned about this brew. Brew is one among the Kukichin group. What he called Kukichin group into Zhou ethnic group. But I raised question on that point. How you can say that brew are the Kukichin group? Uh, please tell me about their origin. Then he spoke only up to Burma. Then after that, he beat around the booze, mentioning about the origin of this mar by there, this and that, but I pointed out again, I said that I am clear about the origin of the Zo ethnic group, but I'm asking you about the Bru. So linguistically, socially, and from every, every other aspect, this Bru, okay, they cannot be classified as Kukichin group, and they cannot be classified as Zo ethnic group. In such a way, I mentioned again in the interaction. That's why we should be clear with it. It does not mean that we have to help them, but we should love them. We should look them with care. But what I would like to tell is that, so ethnicity is based on blood, blood relationship. That's why with regard to this Bru and Chakma, purely 100 person, they are not from the Zoe ethnic group. Okay, sir. I think that clearly clarifies the question. And the last question is the presentation, yeah, the last question is, is the resource person really true in saying that there is free and fair election in Mizoram without the involvement of money? That is the question, sir. Ah, that involvement of money is the thing which cannot be proved. That's why maybe somewhere or in some location may be distributed, but compared to our neighboring states compared to other states of India. The election system, it is still very free and fair. 
in certain area, there may be some youngsters who ask money from the candidates and in, in such a way, such incident may be there. But having said that, money may be distributed somewhere. That does not uh, mean that Mizoram election is bad. Generally, so it's voter cast his her own vote. Absentee vote is never casted. But in other states of India, even if a person is present or not, his or vote will be casted. Then bundles and bundles of money will be distributed. Then there is election violence. And many untoward incidents will happen. So, though I say that our system is good, it does not mean that it may be 100 percent. So, this shows that still we have more assignment to perform, more awareness to create and to create and more to do. Okay, sir. There is one more question that arrived just now, sir. Uh, the question is, does the Chakma Autonomous District Council have constitutional background? Can it be dissolved? That is the question, sir. I think uh, that whole issue cannot be, but let me try to clarify it briefly. So I mentioned that the first time Chakma entered Lusay Hills was in Lusay Expedition of 1871-72 when they came as Koli, but they returned back. And after that, <clears throat> uh, due to order issued by Sir Charles Elliot, Lieutenant Governor of Bengal, some Chakma settlement in Demagri and surrounding was transferred to South Lusai Hills. Then after South Lusai Hills and North Lusai Hills were amalgamated into Lusai Hills district in 1898, that few Chakma settlement remain. Those Chakma who became part of Lusa Hills due to that land transfer uh, issued by Charles Idiot, they are bona fide Chakma, but they were very few. And after the influx started, then during that time, in the Prayan Chakma Autonomous District Council, known as Uipum Tlangdung, because this Uipum Tlangdung was the chiefdom of Tlang Lao, Bom, and Pang Chiefs. And there was no single Chakma settlement in Uipum Tlangdung at the time. Then in this Uipum Tlangdung, Chakma became to enter starting from 1930s and 1920s. Then they were employed as laborers by Tlang Lao Chief in Pedi Fir. Then in such way, the migration continued on. And after the Poilakha Regional Council and Mizo District Council came up, so the Chakma illegal immigrants, they already occupied majority of land in this Uipum Tango. Then for those people who immigrated illegally, when the Northeastern Area Reorganization Act 1971 was amended by the Indian parliament, provision was laid down by which one more clause was inserted in six schedule in paragraph one, sub paragraph two, then clause eight was added. By that, regional council may be divided into two or more regional council. And with that provision, Poi local regional council was trifurcated into three regional council for Poi, Lakar, and Sakma. And after that, that those three regional councils were upgraded to autonomous district council. The way how they occupied the land, it was illegal. They were illegal immigrants. But for these illegal immigrants, 
Sakuma Autonomous District Council was constitutionally created. Though they enter and settle here illegally, the manner how the district council was created, it was created by Act of Indian Parliament because of that it was constitutional. That's why the creation of Sakuma Autonomous District Council was constitutional. And there is only one body which can abolish CADC and that is Indian Parliament. Okay, sir. I think all questions have been clarified to uh, straight to the point. And now we have come to the conclusion of tonight's session. And again, I'd like to thank our resource person for tonight, Professor Dongal. Sir, I thank you on behalf of the participants and the organizing team for your insightful inputs, as well as sharing your intellectual expertise. I hope that the participants will benefit greatly from what you have discussed with us uh, tonight. So tomorrow we will resume our webinar session at 7.30 at night again, and our resource person will be, as I've already mentioned, Reverend Dr. Kate Hanzawa, Director, Greenhill Public School. And I would like to thank all the participants. As of now, there are still 127 participants who are still with us here for being with us all throughout the session. So I bid you all farewell for tonight, good night for tonight, and I hope we all meet again tomorrow night. Okay, sir, thank you again. Cool, thank you. Okay, good night. Good night, everyone.